siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 12, a group of Greeks came searching for Jesus. And Jesus suddenly declares that his hour, his time to be crucified and lifted up on the cross has come. Their arrival sets in motion a series of events, and in particular, Jesus eating one final meal with his disciples. The last thing that needed to happen, however, was for one of the disciples to betray him. And so to that end, during the meal, Jesus gives Judas a piece of bread and says to him, go quickly and do what you have planned. With that, Jesus, Judas rose up and went out. Jesus' hour had now truly come. There was no going back now. The betrayal had been set in motion and could not be stopped. Judas had gone out, and Jesus knew what this meant. However, he also knew that his disciples were not going to understand the implications of what had just happened and what was going to take place. In fact, although it was too late, the disciples were going to fight and resist and eventually run away. So this was Jesus' final last opportunity to say what he wanted and needed to say to them. Instead of addressing the disciples as students, he spoke to them, well, as, with an intimacy that conveyed the, the poignancy of this special moment in his life. Little children, Jesus said to these grown men, listen to me now. I am getting ready to go to a place where you cannot come. So it's important that we have this time together now. Many of us have experienced something similar, a final intensive conversation with someone we love who knew that they were not going to be with us for very much longer. This is one of those truly sacred moments in life that we are supposed to remember for the rest of our lives. In the same way, we are meant to remember these words of Jesus in a way that befits the circumstances in which he spoke them. Getting right to the point, laying aside his usual way of speaking in parables and paradoxes, Jesus simply said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. That's it. This new command is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate, and it is profound enough that the most mature believers among us are repeatedly embarrassed at how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another, how embarrassing it is for many of us who call ourselves Christians to recall that Jesus wanted us to that Jesus wanted to make it easy for us by having us focus on this one thing. Yet, as I noted last Sunday, we have found so many other ways in which to identify true believers and often have a hard time putting this commandment into practice in our own lives. Jesus does not talk about the importance of the Bible or the creed or, or a carefully constructed creed. The New Testament wouldn't be finished for another two to three generations after Jesus' death. And the Nicene Creed, well, that wouldn't be hammered out by combative theologians for another 250 to 300 years. The Bible and the Creed would become, however, incredibly and terribly important to human beings over the years. While the one thing most important to Jesus, well, that would get lost as Christians wrestled over power and orthodoxy. What Jesus wanted us to know, apparently, was that although people would fight wars over who held correct beliefs, this was not Jesus' primary concern. Jesus' way was the way of little children, not the way of learned theologians and intelligent preachers. Little children, he said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. The commandment is not about what we believe, but how we live. In her autobiographical work, The Spiral Staircase, Karen Armstrong notes that in most religious traditions, faith is not about belief, but about practice. 
Religion, Armstrong writes, is not about having to believe a, or, or accept a, a certain difficult propositions. Instead, religion is about doing things that change you. This came to her, home to her, especially when she wrote her first book on Islam. Muslims, she came to understand, are not expected to accept a, a complex creed. Instead, they are required to perform a certain to perform certain ritual actions, such as the Hajj pilgrimage or the fast of Ramadan, which are designed to change them. Muslims are to prostrate themselves in prayer facing Mecca several times a day as an act of surrender. Muslims are commanded to give alms to the poor and more vulnerable among them as a way of cultivating the kind of generosity of spirit that makes them want to give generously, as God does. Armstrong says these repeated actions are intended to lead to, to personal transformation. The point is that this is not a belief system, but a process. The religious life made people act in ways that were supposed to change them forever. Christianity, of course, has its own share of ancient practices and rituals. Liturgy and the sacraments are just the beginning that shape our lives in the image of Christ. Although Christians today are often concerned more about who is traditional and who is progressive, perhaps the more important concern has to do with who's more effective at exhibiting the love of Christ in their lives. After all, Jesus did not say, they will know you are my disciples if you believe the right things. <laughs> Judas had gone out. There was, and this was Jesus' last opportunity to get his point across to the disciples. No more parables, no more paradoxes, just a simple commandment. Little children, love one another as I have loved you. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Amen. Amen.